Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Life Spring. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Dylan. I'm one of the pastors on staff. And I especially want to welcome those of you who perhaps it's your first time ever in church or maybe it's your first time back in church in a while. We are thrilled that you're with us today. Um, this month, before we get going, uh, is Ready to Serve Month. So over the next four weeks, um, what you're going to hear um, each week is you're going to hear a little plug for all of our volunteer teams. Now, here's the thing. Without our volunteer teams, who are awesome, we could not do what we want. So at the very start of this, can we just give a hand to every single person who serves here at LifeSpring? Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody who serves here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So the two teams uh, for this week that I want to mention, first off, is campus safety. Uh, oh, and one, one more thing before I get going too far into this. Um, one of the reasons we're bringing this up this month uh, is, first off, we don't have much longer here at Johnston Community College. Uh, we don't have an official move-in date yet for our new home, um, but we do want to make sure that when we do move in, that we're as fully staffed as possible. The other thing we want to do is we want to finish out our time here at JCC really well, so that way we can both have uh, momentum while we're here, but also momentum when we launch into the new building from a serving standpoint. So the first team is campus safety. Now, here's why you would want to get involved in campus safety, uh, and, and I particularly want to address the guys. Um, perhaps you're the type of guy that you're like, well, I, I don't want to change baby diapers. And, and other than perhaps my child, I'm not really into kids or, or, or whatever. Um, and, and you'd say, I'm not a tech nerd in the best way possible. Uh, I don't play an instrument. I definitely don't want to greet people. And maybe you're kind of big and burly and you intimidate people. Listen, we want you on campus safety. We want you on campus safety. Here's what campus safety does. For right now, they keep our kids ministry area safe. But when we move into our new home, everything will be uh, closer together, so they'll actually have a much bigger role, bigger role in making sure our entire facility is safe during our Sunday experience. So if that's you and you're a dude, we want you. I want you for campus safety, so you can drop by. Um, where, where are they going to be at? They're going to be in the lobby, David. I can't remember what you just all decided about that. Okay, where I typically am. Okay, cool. So if you want to get involved in campus safety, they will be right out the doors right there afterwards. The second team <clears throat> is load in, load out. Now, load in, load out, let me show you a couple pictures. This is what this room looks like before load in, load out. This is what it looks like after. Now, um, that does not happen by magic. That happens by guys and girls getting here at like 6.50. They move tables, they move chairs, they do load in, load out, or they, they do pipe and drape, run all these cables. They do all this stuff upstairs for our kids' ministry area. Load in, load out is perhaps the most crucial volunteer team we have right now because without load in, load out, we couldn't do church right now. And so some of these guys um, and gals have been doing this for two years since we've been here. Rarely take a break. They're awesome. What we want to do is bless them by sending reinforcements for our last few months here. So here's my challenge to every single person in this room. If, even if you are serving, I want to challenge you to give one Sunday a month to load in, load out. I'm not asking you to, to, you to do every week. I'm not asking you to do every other week. If you are not already involved in load in, load out, give one Sunday a month to it for the next three or four months while we're still in this building. It will be a tremendous, tremendous blessing uh, to those men and women who work so, so hard every single Sunday. And you can also go right out those doors afterward. Lamar, raise your hand real quick. You'll want to see this guy right here. And, um, and he'll get you all hooked up for load in, load out. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 2 today. If you don't have a Bible, everything will be on screen. If you don't have a Bible because you don't own a Bible, uh, you can drop by Next Steps. They will give you a Bible for free. By the way, where are my Wolfpack fans at? Wolfpack fans, can I just say this real quick? Thank you all so much for praying during the fourth quarter yesterday as we tried to throw the game away, but I just think some of y'all must have been praying because we won, shockingly. So thank you all for that. Now, now we have two weeks to get hyped for Clemson. So go Wolfpack. Anyway, um, next week, next week um, we're going to talk about how to get unstuck in your singleness. So if you're here and you're not married, you need to be here next Sunday. It's going to be awesome. And if you're here and you are married, I know what you're thinking. You're like, this is the week I don't have to go to church. Wrong, wrong, wrong. If you are here and you are married, I really do believe next week might be 
the best marriage counseling you'll ever get. You might be like, it's tailored to singles. We all need counseling. Amen? Amen. So you need to be here too. Today we're going to talk about how to get unstuck from our past, and I'll set it up like this. How many of y'all have ever done something and you knew that you shouldn't do it, but you did it anyway? Show of hands, show of hands, everybody in the room. Awesome. Great. So my freshman year down at Southern Wesleyan, um, which was a small school about 10 minutes from Clemson, I went down there to play baseball because I wasn't good enough to play at Clemson, so I played at a smaller school, um, which was not anywhere near as good as Clemson. Um, but I went down there, and, and, and entering um, a college athletic arena as a freshman, your ego is just naturally large because you were the man in high school, and you were awesome. And I was a really, really good high school ball player, so I had big dreams. I'm like, I'm going to go down here, and I'm going to take this league by storm, and I'm going to win a starting position. I'm going to work my rear end off in the fall, and I'm just going to, I'm going to be awesome. So with that mindset, you are often encouraged to do things that, that, that coaches call pushing yourself, which really is code for making really bad decisions that will probably get you hurt, but you do them anyway to impress the coach. Um, and so one of these particular days, we were doing 60-yard sprints. And I, and I did my two sprints, but before I did them, my, my leg wouldn't stretch. It just was really, really tight. And I was like, well, that's, that's probably not good. Uh, but I got my two sprints done, and everything was fine. But then I was like, I'm going the extra mile. I'm going to run one more because I'm a, I'm a big shot, and I can, I can impress the coaches and all that sort of stuff. And so I got up there, and I was competing against the guy who, who was, it was also his first year there. And so I started, and things were going really good, and I got probably seven or eight good sprints and good strides into it, and I heard my leg go pop. When your leg pops, that is not natural and not normal. And it's bad. Then it felt like up around my like my groin area, my uh, like up here in my hip, it felt like somebody set a match to it. And, and it just burned. And so I pulled up and hobbled off, and I couldn't do anything for the rest of the fall because cause my leg was hurt. And, and so, and which was disappointing to say the least. So I go in there with these big dreams about everything I'm gonna do and how awesome I'm gonna be and that sort of stuff. And then I do this thing that I knew I shouldn't do to start with, but I did it anyway. And I got hurt, and I couldn't do anything that fall, really. And so what would cross my mind often is, man, if only I hadn't done that. If only I hadn't decided to run one more sprint, then things would be so much different for me right now. Now, that's the story of me making a bad decision and hurting my leg and kind of my aftermath of that. But perhaps for some of you, that same question that kind of drifted through my mind often that fall is a question that drifts through your mind, this idea of, man, if I hadn't done blank, my life would be so much different. Or, or maybe it's something like, man, if blank hadn't happened to me, then my life would be so much different. Because perhaps maybe years ago, months ago, decades ago, maybe you started out with big dreams of what your life was going to be like, maybe if you were a Christian, and then maybe you had big ideas of maybe what God might call you to do and, and that sort of thing. But then something happened, or you made a poor decision, and as a result, it's kind of changed the trajectory of that to where you're in a place to where the question is always, man, if I hadn't done this, if this hadn't happened to me, then my life would be so much different. And I don't know what that thing is. Perhaps, perhaps it was a divorce, perhaps it was abuse, perhaps it was a, a poor financial decision, perhaps it was you met a guy or you met a girl and you knew they were bad news, but, but you kind of went along with them anyway and, and it messed your life up. I, I don't know specifically what your story would be, but, but for many of us in this room, we've all been there, that if I never met that person, if I'd never gone to that place, if I'd never made that decision, then my life would be so much different. Or, or maybe it wasn't a person, maybe it was a place, maybe it was just something that happened, maybe it was, maybe it was a miscarriage. Maybe a spouse walked out on you. Maybe, maybe the economy went belly up and it left you with nothing and all these different things maybe have happened and it's changed the trajectory of your life to where your thought just constantly is, man, if, if, if blank hadn't happened, then my life would be so much different. Here's the challenge. Blank did happen. And even though it was in the past, here's the funny thing about our past. Our past has a funny way of following us into our present. And our past has a funny way of 
filtering the way we look at life and the decisions that we make in the present. And what we often can tend to think of is, man, because of all this stuff that happened, whether I did it or it just kind of happened or somebody else did it to me, that's determined where I am right now. And, and I, don't, I don't see a way out of that because this happened, so therefore that's who I am, so this is kind of where I'll always be. And we can feel like because of our past we're in this place where we're stuck and we don't know the way forward. So what do we do with that? I think we'll find some things from, from Scripture today that'll be helpful, and we'll find them out from the life of a guy named Moses. So, so let me give you some background to Moses, who also um, did something in his past and ended up kind of stuck in a certain spot. We'll discover that in a second. But some background for Moses, if you've been in church world your whole life, and this will be reviewed, but you need to review it anyway because you don't know it all anyway, so it's just a fact. Um, and if you don't know what, who Moses is, then this will be good for you. Um, by the way, Charlton Heston Moses, way more Austin than Christian Bale Moses. Just wanted to throw that out there. Maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. If it doesn't, you're probably better off for it. But for the few that does mean something, then, then, then oh, cool, cool. Um, so Moses is born in a time period. Moses is born in a time period where um, the Hebrews or the nation of Israel has been enslaved by the nation of Egypt. Um, eventually the population of the Hebrews gets so big that the Pharaoh freaks out and he's like, man, we got to get, get these guys under control because they'll become big enough to where they can overthrow us. So the Pharaoh had a great idea. Let's kill all the baby boys as they're born. Let's kill them, which, which kind of is confusing because it's like that's your primary like manual labor force and you're killing them. But it, hey, no politicians ever come up with an awesome idea, right? Things just haven't changed in thousands of years. Um, but he's like, we're going to kill all the baby boys. Um, so they do this. Moses is born, and, 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 and Moses' mom and dad were like, well, we're not giving our child up. We're going to protect him. Um, and they do this for a few months, and finally they come to the conclusion, we cannot protect our child anymore. And so Moses' mama makes a basket, coats it with tar, sticks it in the Nile River, and says, God, save my child. Now, let me pause and make a note on that real quick. You should not read the first part of Exodus 2 and be like, that's awesome parenting advice. Because if you have a newborn and you're like, I can't handle the screaming anymore, I'm going to stick him in the noose river and be like, God save my child, you probably shouldn't do that. Not, almost, not unless you want DSS coming knocking at your door. Like, like That probably would just be weird. So, so, so maybe Moses' mama is not the best to look for Maybe parenting advice, like she did it. There's nothing that said God told her to do it, but she did it. But God was in charge because God directs this basket that poor, helpless Moses is in and directs it right up to where Pharaoh's daughter is swimming. And she opens up the basket and it's like, oh, a Hebrew baby. And then she's like, I'm going to adopt him. So look, look how much Moses' life changes. He goes from endangered species to royalty. Like, immediately. And like, like that's a pretty good deal for him. And so eventually, Moses grows up. Um, and we know that eventually, Moses comes to realize that he is not an Egyptian, that he is ethnically a Hebrew. We don't know if his stepmom told him. Uh, we don't know if he was watching Egyptian Sesame Street. And uh, maybe it came on and said, one of these things is not like the other. And he was like, I am not Egyptian. Like, maybe that's what happened. I don't know. But eventually, he comes to the conclusion, I'm ethnically a Hebrew, and, and eventually this breaks his heart. And we know from, from Acts chapter 7, uh, in a speech by a guy named Stephen, that Moses comes to think that God wants to use him to deliver the people of Israel from slavery and to leverage his position in the palace to do that. And so with that in mind, we get to Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. It says this, one day after Moses had grown up, he was about 40 years old, by the way. That'll be mildly important later on. He went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that and seeing no one. In other words, he knew he shouldn't. He knew it was wrong. He knew he should probably just have some restraint here. It says, looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Heartbreak, he's like, I can't take this anymore. This is unjust. This is wrong. I know I shouldn't. I'm going to make sure nobody's looking. I'm going to kill the guy and hide him, and everything will be okay. So he does this. And then verse 13, the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? In other words, dude, who do you think you are? 
Like, I know you look like us. I know you're ethnically a Hebrew. I don't know what strings you had to pull to get in your place, but, but you act like you care about us. You've been sitting in luxury for 40 years. We've been down here getting beaten, having to work in the mud pits, build, make bricks and all that sort of stuff. And, and all of a sudden, you come up to me and we're supposed to respect you? No, 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 no. You, you haven't been where, where we are. We're not, we're, we're, not, we're not interested in your help. Thank you very, very much. Oh, and by the way, are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? And this freaks Moses out. And says, Moses was afraid and thought what I did must have become known. It had become known because when Pharaoh heard this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to Midian where he sat down by a well. And then chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness. So Moses goes from endangered species to royalty to shepherd on the backside of the desert. And by the way, in Jewish culture and Egyptian culture, it didn't get lower than a shepherd. Like that was the bottom of the totem pole in terms of what you could be doing. So let me ask you this. Do you ever think Moses had the thought, man, if only I hadn't killed that guy, my life would be so much different right now. Do you ever think he thought, if I hadn't killed that guy, then maybe I really could have done some good for my own people and helped them out. But I had a moment of anger, a moment of rage. I lost control, and now I'm stuck here on the backside of the desert. And it doesn't matter what sort of dreams I used to have. That, that, ain't, that ain't happening anymore. <clears throat> maybe, maybe, that's what, maybe that's what you feel like. Maybe you feel like you're on the backside of the desert, so to speak, because you, and you're doing something that, that wasn't even in, in, in your plans. And you would say, man, it's because I did this or because this thing happened to me or because this person did something to me. And now I'm here. And man, if that hadn't happened, my life would be different. But it did happen, so here I am. And I don't, I don't, I don't know where to go and I don't see a way forward. <clears throat> and perhaps you're even here with that and Maybe your thought is uh, that, that you don't even know if, if God can reach you where you're at. You're not, sure if, you're not sure if even God sees you where you're at. But look at the last part of verse 1. This is so interesting. It says, Moses led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So see, here's the thing. We can, t- we can tend to think that we're at a certain place in life because of our past and that God has forgotten us when reality is God actually pursues you, and in fact, the fact that you're here today is evidence that he's pursuing you. And God actually, instead of staying far away from us, even when we're in a place where we think we have no hope because of our past, God actually comes to you. God actually pursues you. The greatest evidence of this is Jesus Christ coming to earth. Because, see, God could have said, you know what, y'all are messed up. You know what, y'all try to work your way to me and see how that works out. It wouldn't have because we can't work our way to God. But instead, he sends Jesus to earth to live the perfect life that we could never live among us as one of us and then goes to die the death we should have died in our place to make a way for us to come to God. See, God pursues you. And he's pursuing you right now. He doesn't say, hey, you figure it out. And when you figure it out, you, you, you come find me. No, he comes right to you because he wants to meet you exactly where you are, in your mess, in your stuckness, even if your past is, at, is as wretched and rotten and disgusting as anyone could possibly fathom. Jesus still says, hey, I'm pursuing you and I want you to come to me. And he doesn't want to just get you unstuck from your past. He wants to get you unstuck from your sin. He doesn't want to just improve your life. He wants to give you a brand new life through a relationship with him. And he doesn't want to just get you saved. He wants to give you a brand new purpose that will matter for eternity. However, the only way we get that is when we approach God on the terms that he defines. And that's important to understand because sometimes we can think that because of our awful past that God should maybe um, make an exception for us. No, no, no. God defines the terms and he doesn't change them. And he says, if you want to move forward, I've come to you, but you've got to accept my terms and conditions. 
And I know for some of us, it's like, I'm not so sure I want to do that because I don't know what God's terms and conditions are. Please, listen. You accept terms and conditions you don't know all the time. Because every time you have a software update on your phone, it's like, well, do you, do you, have you read and accept the terms and conditions? And you're like, yes. Which has made a liar out of every single person in the room. Myself included. You know why? Because none of us read the terms and conditions. If you are, I would like to know you. You can come help us out of the new building because you obviously have no life. I mean, you, you, you accept terms and conditions that you don't know all the time. This is why the president now has your phone number, because it was embedded in the terms and conditions, probably. You sign it away, so just you can thank yourself for that. Awesome. Good job. Um, but the thing about those terms and conditions, when they pop up, why do we accept them, even though we don't read them? Because we want the software update. We're like, well, I want something better, so I'm going to do this, even though I have no idea what it is. Well, guess what? Same thing is true with God. You're like, I'm not sure what God is going to ask of me. Guess what? It doesn't mean you don't accept his terms and conditions because God wants something better for you, but if you want what God has for you, you have to accept his terms. The good news is God actually tells you his terms because he tells Moses his terms, and we'll find that out here in verse 2 through 11. Here we go. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Here's the terms God puts out. And let me say this first. God's not making a statement that one place is much more sacred than another. See, because what we can tend to do is look at that and be like, I need to find holy ground. Well, holy ground doesn't really exist anymore because God's presence is everywhere. And you can meet God anywhere, at any time, in any place. Hey, newsflash, you don't have to come to church to meet with God. Like, we do realize that, right? Like, you don't need to come to the front of an auditorium and get on your hands and knees to meet with God. You can meet with God in your own home. This place here, this place that we're going to move into, it, like all it is is, is, is is wood and concrete and carpet and tables. It's not like this sacred, holy place to where it's like, oh my gosh, if I want to meet with God, i got to go to the church building. No, no, you don't. You can meet with God anywhere, anytime, any place. But what God commands us to do is understand that if we're going to approach Him, we understand that he is holy and we approach him as thus. That's what God's command to Moses. He's like, hey, Moses, if you're going to approach me, you have to approach me as holy. You say, what does that mean? Holy means perfect, beyond perfection, infinite perfection, without sin. You know what happens when we approach God as holy? We come to understand that we are not. You know what else happens? We understand that not only are we not holy, we're actually pretty messed up. We're actually pretty wicked. We're actually pretty evil and rotten. See, when we approach God as holy, we don't all of a sudden think, I'm awesome. When we approach God as holy, we start to see that there's this infinite gulf between God and us. You know what that leads us to the conclusion of? I'm, I, 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 can't, I couldn't ever possibly be good enough for God. And I can't make myself good enough for God. Which ultimately leads to, I need a Savior. You know how some of y'all are convinced that you don't need a Savior? Because you don't understand how holy God is. See, you, 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 th you think God is kind of like you, just maybe a little better? No, 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 no. There, there's an infinity of space between us and God compared to our wickedness and God's holiness, an infinity of space. And until you recognize that, you'll never see your need for a Savior. But once you recognize that, you come to the conclusion, I, I, need, I, need, I need a Savior. God's already provided a Savior through Jesus Christ because I cannot make myself. Because if God is infinitely good and there's an infinity separating between an infinitely holy God and an infinitely evil me, then, then I'm finite. I'm created. I can't cross that gap. I need someone to cross it for me. Hence, Jesus comes to earth and dies and bridges the gap between us so that we can come 
to God as holy, not because we make ourselves better, but because through Christ, God makes us holy. So if you want to get unstuck from your past, the first thing you have to do, you have to approach God as holy. You know how you do that? Through his son. Through his son, and there's no other way. There's no other option. And here's what starts to happen when we do that, though. Verse 6, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When you approach God on his terms, when you come to God through Christ, guess what God does? He reveals who he is to you. He reveals his character to you. You actually get to know him. And in fact, in the course of this conversation, God is going to reveal himself to Moses as I am in, in, in a way that he never revealed himself to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or any of these other guys. He reveals himself to Moses in a way that had never been done that we know of in history up to this point. But it doesn't start by Moses saying, hey God, you come meet me where I am. No, it starts Moses comes to God on God's terms. Then God reveals who he is. If you want to get to know God, Come to God through Christ. See, because maybe some of y'all are like, well, I'll come to God if he'll, if he'll kind of introduce himself to me. Um, he's already done that through Christ to start with. And, and by the way, you don't get to set the terms. You come to God through Christ, then God will reveal himself to you. And by the way, he'll also start to reveal his plan for you. And he'll reveal his plan for you as he changes you. Because watch Moses' reaction here. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. When I come to God on his terms, and I get to know God, you know what the result is? Humble worship. Moses bowing down to the ground and hiding his face is humble worship because he realizes, oh, th th this is God, and, and, and I'm not worthy, and yet he's made himself known to me. And so he hides his face. If you come to God on his terms, he reveals himself to you. The result is worship. So let me ask you this this morning. Regardless of, of where you are, in, in, in whether you feel like you're stuck in your past or, or maybe not, man, is your posture towards God a posture of worship? Because if you want, let me, let me define worship. Worship is not, I'm singing in church, although that's awesome. It really is. Worship is the totality of my life is lived for God's glory and for his fame and for his purpose. Until you put yourself in a posture of worship, you will not move forward. You know what our posture typically is when it, when it comes to getting stuck in our past? Our posture is typically victim. And listen, I'm not trying to be insensitive here, although, although granted I don't really have the sensitive gene, so if what I come across, if what I say comes across as blunt, it's because I love you. But as long as we're like, woe is me, life screwed me over, my life is sad, as long as that's your posture, you're never going to move forward because as long as you are a victim, you will not walk in victory. You need to move your posture to, woe is me, to look how great God is. That's what we need to move to if we're going to move forward. And that's not to discount what happened. That's not to say it wasn't bad. That's not to say it wasn't legitimately painful. It was. But Jesus nailed all that to the cross. Jesus wiped away all your shame at the cross. And he, he didn't die for us so we could be woe is me. He died for us so we could be look how great God is. When we start looking at God, he starts to show us the way forward just like he does to Moses here. Verse 7, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land and into a good and spacious land, a, milk, a land flowing with milk and honey, also known as Krispy Kreme donuts. Amen. Praise God. I added that. That's, that's, not, that's not in any version ever. The home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now... Go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people in Israel, of the Israelites out of Egypt. Now, this is the very thing Moses wanted 40 years ago. Like 40 years has passed since he's killed the Egyptian. And now God's like, hey, Moses, guess what? Here I am. You come to me on my terms. Great. I've got a job for you. You go back and you go do that thing that I wanted you to do 40 years ago anyway. You weren't ready for it then. 
But now it's time. You go and you, I'm going to use you to lead the people out of Egypt. And so Moses responds, verse 11, it says, Moses said, God, thank you so much for calling me. I've always felt I was up to this. I am awesome. Thank you for recognizing how great I am in this dream that I always wanted to do. Thank you for, oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't say that at all. In fact, the response Moses gives is really interesting, verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? That's weird. Because here's God saying, hey, I'm calling you to do the thing that, that you've always wanted to do. And yet Moses is essentially like this phrase right here. Write it down. I can't. I can't. Now, this is going to be a little tricky, but, 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 but try to follow me, and I'll, I'll try to make it as clear as possible. We can tend to think of I can't as a very, very negative phrase. And, and in some sense, it is. Like, like, like if you've got to get up early and you're in the morning, you have a hard time getting out of bed, and you're like, I can't get up early. No, you're just lazy, and you have an addiction to the snooze button, and you should stop it. Not to be like blunt or rude or anything, I'm just saying. But sometimes I can't is the best possible thing we can learn. In fact, perhaps you're here this morning and perhaps you wonder, why did God let all this crap happen in my life? And I don't know, but it could be that perhaps God in his sovereignty, even though the thing that happened to you was evil, God is able, and this is one of the beautiful things about God and his grace and how he's able to turn things on its head. Perhaps God used what the devil meant to destroy you to get you in a place where you're no longer self-confident and you're no longer sure of yourself and you no longer think you're awesome, but to move you to a place to where you realize that you can. See, because Moses, 40 years ago, he's like, I can do this because I'm awesome. But now he gets in this place where he's like, I can't. And you know what? God agrees with him. God would agree with Moses. You're right, you can't. And see, if you're here, you're stuck in your past, you might be like, well, I can't move forward. You know what God would say? You're exactly right. And perhaps that's the point he's wanted to get you to the whole time is for you to realize that you are completely and utterly incapable of moving forward in your own power. Which is why God says this to Moses. And God said, Moses, you just need more self-confidence. Moses, I've arranged for you to go on Oprah, and she's going to talk to you while you're on a couch, and you will come out brimming with confidence. Moses, you just need to believe in yourself and try harder. My eyes are messed up today because they didn't say that either. Watch what God said, and God said, I will be with you. He didn't say, Moses, you just need better self-esteem. He, he effectively agrees with Moses, like, you know what, you're right, but guess what? I'll be with you. Y'all, that's the answer that we ultimately need. Whether you need to get unstuck from your sin or your past, it's not try harder. It's not be a better you. It's not get better at life. The answer is God. In fact, write this down. God's answer to I can't is himself. That's why he sent Jesus to save us. That's why he didn't give us a religious checklist because he's like, you know what? You don't have the answer. You don't have the ability. But I do. And so my answer is myself. Here I am. I'll be with you. And God would say that to you today if you're stuck in your past. You're like, I can't move forward. God would say, you're right. You can't. But you know what? If you come to me on my terms, guess what? I'll be with you. And, y'all, that's the game changer. The game changer is not I believe more nice things about myself. The game changer is I recognize that I had the Holy Spirit of God with me. And you know what? If you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in you. And if He defeated death, guess what? He can get you unstuck from your past. And listen, I don't know that we understand. Have you ever considered as a follower of Christ that God lives in you? That doesn't mean you're God. Because some people take that and get really, really funky theology out of it. And if you do that, we'll talk. We won't burn you at the stake, but we'll we'll shake you around a little bit, get your get your mind right. I'm just kidding. We won't do that either. But we'll we'll talk to you. Um, 
But have you ever considered that God himself, if you're a follower of Jesus, God lives in you? By the way, that'll change the way we live. We live because if God lives in me, guess what? That'll change the way I treat my spouse. It'll change the way I treat my kids. If you're a teenager, it'll change the way you treat your parents. It'll change the way I handle money. It'll change the way I view church. It'll change the way I manage my time. We understand God lives in me. It'll change the way you treat your body. And it'll change the way you view your past because if God himself lives in you through his Holy Spirit because you've stepped into a relationship with Christ, guess what? It doesn't matter how awful your past is. It has no power on you because Jesus already nailed it to the cross. Which begs the question, why don't we move forward? Because I have a feeling that, that if you're here and you're a Christian, intellectually you probably know that. You may not dwell on it much, but intellectually you probably are like, yeah, the Holy Spirit lives in me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay I get it. But, but why don't we move forward? I would submit it's because we look the wrong direction. For example, if you get in your car on I-95 and you're going, let's just say, north, and you get in and the driver's seat and you're facing, let's see, I don't remember which way north is. We'll just pretend this is north, even if that's wrong. I don't know. Because I think that actually might be more. So let's, let's say this south. Okay, south. So if you're going south, you get in your car and you're facing this way, and I tell you, push the gas, you're going to be like, uh-uh, because I can't see. All, all I see is that way. I see cars coming this way, but I can't see behind me, and I choose life. I don't want to die, so I'm not moving. And if that was you, you know what I would tell you? Turn your car around. Things will get better. I promise. You know what some of us need to do in terms of moving forward? We need to turn our car around. You know why? Because we're stuck looking at our past. That's why we never move forward. Because all we're focused on is, look at this bad thing that happened. And God's like, well, turn around. Turn around. Because when, when we look back at what happens, you know what happens? We convince ourselves more and more, there's no way I can move forward. Even if God is with me, even if God is in me, I can't move forward because of all this that happened and it creates all this other stuff. And all it results in for us, quite frankly, is excuses. Because Moses goes on to give excuse after excuse after excuse as to why he can't move forward. And his ultimate excuse, in a lot of ways, is Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. This is what he says to God. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. In other words, um, God, I know this all sounds great and everything, but uh, I murdered a guy, by the way. And by the way, when I tried it, I tried to lead these guys, and they didn't want anything to do with me back then. You know why, God? Because I'm not a good speaker. And this whole leader thing, it requires, like, communication skills and oratory prowess. And, God, I've never been that way. And, by the way, I know you're, like, with me and everything, but ever since you showed up, like, that, like, that hadn't changed. Still not a good speaker. Honestly, I can relate to Moses. Because, you know, the one thing I said that God would never call me to do because I hate doing it? Talk in front of other people. Believe it or not, because when God first called me into ministry, I was like, well, I'll drum in a band like Skillet because I, I, I can drum, but I hate talking in front of people. God would never call me to preach. Try telling God what you'll never do. You know what I think God does? I think he chuckles. But you know what's interesting about that now? Um, this is the only time I don't get nervous talking in front of people when I'm preaching. If I got to do anything else in front of people, it freaks the heck out of me. But, but, but that reality reminds me that th this thing I do here is, is not something I'm naturally gifted at. It's, it's not something I'm naturally good at. It's not something I'm remotely comfortable with. But, but, but God works through it, not because I'm good, but, but because God's great. In fact, I think, I think there are some cases where God wants to use your strengths, but I honestly think that it's far more often that God actually wants to use your weaknesses. So that he can prove that it's, it's not your awesomeness that is getting the job done. It's, it's his greatness. But he still wants to use you, even in your weakness. In fact, watch what God says here. God responds. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf from you? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In other words, Moses, when I made you, I didn't make a mistake. Like, Moses, I know you're not a good speaker. I get it. Okay? But guess what? Verse 12. Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. God, listen, 
God's not asking us to magically transform into something that we're not. He's not asking us to, to forget about everything that happened. What he is saying is, yeah, you know what? That, that is true. But guess what? I'm going to help you along the way. I'll be with you, I'll be in you, and I'll help you. Y'all, that's the ultimate X factor. God doesn't say, go figure it out. Good luck. No, he, he loves us way too much for that. Instead, he says, I will be right here with you the whole time. I will give you the ability to do it, and I'll teach you how to do it. Listen, God's not going to just leave you on your own. And if, you, and if you don't know the way forward, particularly when it comes to getting unstuck from your past, listen, you, you don't have to figure it out on your own. You just need to understand that God is with you. If you're a follower of Christ, God is in you, and God will enable you and show you exactly what to do, which leads us to this posture. Here's how we get unstuck from our past. I will follow God's presence and promises instead of my past. I will follow God's presence and promises instead of my past. I'm going to stop looking backwards, and I'm going to start looking forward. I'm going to stop looking at what happened, and I'm going to start looking at God. There's two questions I want us to consider here before we wrap up. First is this. Where are you looking? Well, like, like what is the focus of your life? Because here's the thing. Your life will drift according to the direction you look. For example, don't, don't try this going home today. Like, don't. But perhaps you've noticed sometimes if you're riding along the highway and something catches your eye over here, like maybe you're going down the highway and you see a beautifully mowed, a beautifully mowed yard, something like that, or a baseball stadium or a baseball field, which is a glorious sight, and you're like, oh, ball field. You know what all of a sudden starts to, starts to happen? You start hitting rumble sticks. You know why? How many of y'all have ever had that happen? Yeah, yeah. You know why? Because you naturally drift where you're looking. And if you're constantly looking backwards, that's where you're going to go. But if you're looking at God, if you're looking at what he said, if you're looking at his presence, that's where we start to move the right direction. So where are you looking? Where's the focus of your life? And the second question I would ask is this. I got an itch in my ear, so if, I'm, if you're like, why does he keep sticking his finger in my ear? Something tickles in there and it's driving me nuts. I don't know how to deal with it. It's just there. So I just try to be as transparent as possible up here. So second question, though. Um, what voice are you listening to? What, what voice are you listening to? I have found a, a, an amazing thing can happen for a male. I don't know if women do this because I'm not a girl, and I don't know how y'all think, so I don't try to figure it out. Um, but men have this very, very unique ability. When we focus on something, the outside world just kind of fades away. And every single wife in here knows what I'm talking about. Because your husband, like my wife calls it my dog bone. Maybe I'm working on a sermon. Maybe I'm watching a game. Maybe I'm reading something on my phone or something like that. And she can be talking to me for like five minutes, and nothing gets through. By the way, wives, next time this happens, Ask him when, it, when he's just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Ask him for $500 to go shopping, uh-huh. And then when you bring home a $500 bill and he freaks out, be like, no, 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 no. You said I could. And even better, get it taped on so you have video evidence. See, but, but here, 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 here's what happens with, with us. So often... We do that when it comes to our past. We so focused on our past that it drowns out the voice of God. And maybe if we would stop focusing on, on this thing that happened and stop listening to what our past says, which is ultimately what the enemy says, which is you're worthless, you're damaged goods, you'll never amount to anything. And maybe if we start listening to the voice of God, which, by the way, you find by reading his word, maybe then we'd start to understand yeah, something damaging may have happened, but in Christ you're not damaged goods. In Christ you're made brand new. In Christ you're beautiful. In Christ you're pure. In Christ you're righteous. In Christ you are able and equipped to do exactly what he's called you to do. That includes moving forward from your past. But you have to change 
where you're looking, and you have to change who you're listening to. And stop living in the past. Now Moses eventually does this. Moses ends up going back to Egypt. God uses Moses not only to deliver the people of Israel from slavery, he actually uses Moses to write the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses leaves a legacy that that affects billions of people. And it happens when he stops living in this mindset of, well, because of what happened to me, I can't move forward. And he starts looking at God's presence and starts following God's promises. And God moves him forward into something significant. So here's a question I have for us to consider as we wrap up. What dreams might come to pass if we stop living in the past? Well, what dreams might come to pass? God-inspired, God-given dreams. What dreams might come to pass in our lives if we stop looking backwards at this thing that happened to us or this thing that did or this hand that life dealt us and we start looking at God? What sort of healing might take place in your life if you stop living in the past? Well, what sort of calling might God call you into if you stop focusing about how many poor decisions you made 20 years ago? What sort of freedom might we step into if we stop thinking we had to keep going to a bottle or something to dull the pain from this thing that happened last decade? Y'all, God has some dreams He wants to put in your heart. He has a tremendous purpose for each and every one of you. He wants each and every one of you to accomplish something significant for His kingdom. But here's what I know. It will not happen if we continue to obsess over this bad thing that happened to me. The only way it happens is when we start looking forward to God and we start listening to Him. As we look at him, as we listen to him, he begins to lead us forward. He begins to move us forward. And he does it through his power and by his grace. Not, 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 not in our own ability, but in a way that only he can. You know what happens when he does that? He'll get the glory for it. Nobody ever would have thought a poor speaker who was a murderer could have ever led the people of God and written five books of the Bible. But this is exactly what Moses did. And I think the reason God uses people like Moses who have a wretched, rotten past. I don't know how bad your past is, but chances are you're probably not a murderer. Just go out on a limb and say that. But even if you are, God can still use you. God still has a plan for you. And we step into that plan when we start following Jesus. And we stop looking backwards. And when we start moving forward and we see God begin to use us, I believe it will happen in such a way that it's incredibly clear to us that, that, that it wasn't anything we did. It was something God did through us by His power and therefore only he will 